Let us pray. Dear Lord, we have opened ourselves up to each other. We have opened ourselves up to you. And we come to that part in the service where you call on us to listen. More and more today, with the busyness and loudness of the world, we are challenged in our ability to sometimes still ourselves, still our souls, and hear what thus saith the Lord. So in this moment, Lord, help us to transition. Calm us down. Let us give up what we think eagerly awaits us. And let us be present in this moment to hear a word from the Lord on high, to hear a message in spite of the messenger. In Jesus' name, amen. Using for a sermonic theme this morning, we are a family. We are a family. Now, some people don't like to be instructed, but if you don't mind, you could look at someone and say, we are a family, if you don't mind. We are a family. Last week, I shared with you all a story about the Coulter family twins and one of their daughters' attachment to her baby blanket. And I likened it to, to us clinging to Jesus, especially in the face of death especially on a Palm Sunday. But the Coulters have two additional kids, and two years ago, their oldest kid went off to college. She grew up in an ideal family where love is love, and watching her mom fight for women's empowerment, and her dad work on behalf of labor justice with a trans sibling welcomed from birth to live their truth. While others struggle with the bureaucracy of church, her faith, helped her to say no to drugs in high school and embrace music and her own sexuality as a gift from God. She blossomed under her parents who encouraged her to be herself and supported her all along the way. She applied to college on the West Coast, causing her whole family to do a summer vacation, traveling for two weeks all the way from Chicago, Illinois to Oregon, Coulter family style. Everything was beautiful, everything was great, until they left her. When a, within a week, Lucy crumbled, as she now considered she had made the worst mistake of her life. This is where we enter the biblical text today. Jesus had journeyed in relationship with the disciples and his devotees long enough for them to feel the whole of his absence. They had walked on foot to different destinations long enough to feel the void of his presence, had found meals and homes in various places enough to now not be able to sleep through the night, had been through tense moments reassured by Jesus' voice that the wind and waves responded to by his command had seen signs and wonders at weddings and more to miss the initiator of it all, had seen miracles undeniably orchestrated by faith in Jesus, Jesus alone, had started on a journey with nothing and seen God, how God provides, had been tied at the hip responding to a job offer that never left them far from Jesus, the superstar. And now the patriarch of their unit was gone, the glue that made it make sense was gone, was dead. If there is such a thing as a low moment, they sat in this low, low moment. Family connections are powerful. Somebody ought to say amen. Whether biological, chosen, or spiritual, family connections are powerful. There's something about coexisting around the same people over long periods of time. You see one another's quirks, don't you? You let your hair down around these people. You become more of who you are, unless you're in a dysfunctional family, and maybe then you become more of who you are not. But in loving families, you care for one another. You take risk with one another. You share more deeply with one another. You go to bat for one another. I've heard some families say, now we might fight amongst ourselves, but if someone on the outside messes with someone in our family, we're going to go to bat for them. 
We connect within the context of family. We learn from each other. We care. We get upset. We love. I think for many of you here at United, it is these connections that matter so much. With deep connections, when those unhidden figures are not around like Lucy and Jesus Posse, we undeniably feel it. I once heard a pastor say there's only one way in and one way out. Maybe I disagree a little bit here, but I get his point. A part of family and coexisting together is the pain of absence. I was headed to my car yesterday when my old boss saw me. I could tell by this woman's eyes she knew me, so I smiled back. I'm used to pretending I know people even when I'm not really sure who they are. But then she called my name, and then I knew that she really, really knew me. Age and no more dyeing or perming her hair had changed her looks completely. The last time I saw her, she was a blonde, but now she was straight, white, and curly. But then the face. As she talked, I looked at the face and the eyes. And then the convo began, and she shared she had laid to rest her, son, her husband back in December of last year. In the midst of lifing, there it is and was, the reason for initial sadness in this Bible story today, Jesus is not with us anymore. As part of the grieving process, sometimes we need to make sense of it, especially when the death is untimely or traumatic. Jesus' death was definitely traumatic. He was young, not bad looking perhaps, ready and in the prime of his ministry. He had grown in popularity. I imagine he would have given Taylor and Beyonce a run for their money had he been around today. He was big. People listened. Their hearts were touched. Their eyes witnessed healing. And like most people of truth, it scared the establishment. Jesus scared the powers that be, and they got him killed and his followers needed to make sense of it all, and now there's a body that is missing. Riley Strain and his college friends were out, out of town in Nashville, Tennessee. They had been drinking in a couple of bars. At the last bar, after one drink, the bar kicks him out for unruly behavior. Here is where things get sketchy. He proceeds to make his way back to the hotel, except when he left, the bar, he should have turned right, but he, he turned left. There is also a report that he got separated from his friends. And because of cameras all over Nashville, he shows up at various places with people asking him if he's okay. He even passes the police district and a police officer talks to him. But by the next morning, Riley is missing. Two weeks pass and they finally decide to search the river. The parents are still hoping they find his body. The city does an autopsy, and now the family has requested a second autopsy. They have a body, and they want to know everything. His mom and dad are still trying to put the pieces together of their baby boy's death, trying to make sense of it all. Surrounding the death of Jesus, we know he died. We spent Good Friday two days ago sitting with his last words. We get how he died, but now there is no body, and we're trying to make sense of it all. Barbara Brown Taylor writes, they were scared, for as wrecked as they were by Jesus' death, they knew how to behave. They knew how to behave in the face of death. You view the body. You seal the tomb, and you go back to the house to eat fried chicken with your neighbors. You accept the finality of what has happened, and you get on with your life diminished as it is. But when the tomb is empty and the body is gone, they were scared, for they didn't know how to behave in the face of death's undoing. This story has an unexpected twist. So many times I watch a movie, and maybe you too, and I'm not sure I like how it ends. 
But this story has an unexpected twist that gives us Easter, that gives us Resurrection Sunday. And I call it family reunion. When Jesus makes this stunning appearance, the one he wrote off is back. The family member we cried about will be arriving shortly. And all the words about reappearing that did not make sense to us before, now we recognize them. The text says, don't be afraid. I know you're looking for Jesus the Nazarene. The one they nailed to the cross. He's been raised up. He's here no longer. You can see for yourselves that the place is empty. Now, on your way, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going on ahead of you to Galilee. You'll see him there, exactly as he said, and he does as they did. And to this I say, it's family reunion time. It's family reunion time. In the 19th century, the concept a family reunions gained popularity as people moved away from their ancestral homes in search of new opportunities. The advent of transportation such as trains and later automobiles made it easier for families to travel longer distance to reunite. The Civil War also played a role as it separated many families, prompting a desire for reunification once peace was restored. During the 20th century, family reunions became more organized events, providing an opportunity for dispersed family members to reconnect, share stories, and strengthen holes. Family reunions are rooted in the human connection and belonging. Jesus orchestrates a family reunion. Despite their initial shock, they are greeted by a messenger proclaiming Jesus has risen from the dead. Despite their loss, this moment marks the beginning of a joyous reunion. A reunion fueled by unbreakable bond of love. We two united are bound together by a love that transcends all barriers. This love demonstrated through Jesus Christ unites us as one family, the family of God. Christ has risen, risen indeed. Across the gospel, witnesses at the empty tomb and appearances of the risen Christ to multiple followers. But here in this text, here in Mark, the tomb is empty and nobody gets to see Jesus or touch the nail holes in his hand. In Mark, there is a promise he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. This promise of Jesus' presence is with us always. The mood is light and we are ready to slide into home base because this is the part of the story we love, where good triumphs over evil intent. We our family, with a message of good news to proclaim to the world. There's this beautiful scene on the internet. It's a scene of a Fijian son, Kition Waka. He left home at an early age to play rugby and has been gone for a while. He makes a surprise return home as a very much fully a grown adult. His body is full and husk and built. His parents sit on an enclosed porch. He lets out this wild, piercing sound. And long before they see him, they recognize the sound of their child. Both parents stand like on command. They rise and they walk over to the screen door. The dad closes his eyes, squeezing them together with his fingers while his wife holds him around the waist. The son moves toward them walking up the steps. The dad opens his arms, and when the son enters, he pulls his son in for eternity. They stay in that position for a while, 
a dad and his son embraced in one another, the dad holding him tight as though no days have passed. Eventually, the dad releases his son and the son pulls his mom in. And as his dad is trying to move toward the side, the, side, the son pulls him back in. And it becomes a hug of three people, the mom, the son, and the dad. And after he releases him, other people start running into each other's arms and hugging one another. We are a family. When we go into the world and whatever we do, that is something we should remember. We are family. As we celebrate Easter, let us rejoice in this family reunion. As much as this story is about resurrection, this story is about Jesus is with us always. Let us get excited about our reunion with Jesus Christ. Through his resurrection, we are united as one family, bound together by this unbreakable bond of love. You know, they say people come and go, but family, family, family is forever. That's what the disciples and devoted followers discover. Jesus returned, and these bonds and this journey make us family. We are a family. Amen.